Well, when I decided that I would become interested in questions involving the separation of church and state, I had absolutely no idea what one of the major consequences of that decision would be. And that is that I would get to speak in all the world's most beautiful churches. So I want to thank very much Vim Van Donk and the other members of the council for the uh, opportunity to add to the list of magnificent European churches in which I've spoken. Thank you very much. Um, we may be at the end of a settlement with respect to religion in the state that has lasted for two or three centuries. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why so many of us have gotten interested in the question of religion and politics. It's been a fairly long period, but it was a period that was, the period that we're in now, was a period that was obviously shaped by the religious and sectarian wars of an earlier time, a period shaped by the Thirty Years' War, by the Protestant Reformations, uh, by uh, the rise of uh, uh, a link between religion and politics in the absolutist monarchies in France, the Inquisition in Spain and Italy, in the Protestant countries by the ominous consistory and Calvin's Geneva, a, a long period in which in our uh, pre-modern history, religion and politics, uh, religion and the state work together in such ways as to convince large numbers of people that if you blend religion and politics too carefully, the result will be sectarian violence, the result will be war, the result will be uh, the oppression of liberty, the oppression of individual conscience, um, uh, such that it was required in one way or another, even in countries which still had officially established churches, but in one way or another, it was required to separate these realms, to protect human liberty, uh, uh, to protect freedom of conscience, and to protect the world against violence. Some separation of religion and politics was required. After all, you had these two models, if you were thinking about these issues. You had the model of religious warfare, and religious oppression, and you had the model of the emerging enlightenment and its testimony to human progress. And if you put the Spanish Inquisition up against the enlightenment, at least for most thinking people, that was no choice at all. Obviously, the model of progress and the model of enlightenment would be one that would be chosen by rational people thinking about, in sort of Kantian terms, about the best uh, choices they could make. Um, and in that sense, some settlement like the one we've experienced for the last couple of hundred years would seem to be inevitable. But now there's increasing the feeling that this settlement, this separation, this decision to put religion in one sphere and to put politics in another, that this may be coming to an end. And I think it's the sense that this may be this long period that emerged out of our religious history may be coming to an end and that we may be entering a new period uh, and a new configuration about how to address these issues is what's worrying or thrilling, depending upon one's perspective, uh, so many individuals. Certainly one evidence that's frequently cited for the fact that this period may be, be coming to an end is my own country. Uh, as Hans Joa suggests, uh, almost no one, whatever their interpretation, would look at the United States as a country that could be described as thoroughly secular. And in my own country, uh, there is an increasing role that religion is playing uh, in the United States. Uh, we have heard many examples of this, and I needn't bore you with them, but I think you are all aware, uh, and probably as concerned as I am, that when the president of the world's leading superpower says that part of the reason he makes the foreign policy decisions that he does is because God has spoken to him, uh, you, you begin to think that perhaps we're not in the era of the Enlightenment and the era of separation of church and state anymore. Uh, so uh, the United States, which has seen the rise of the religious right, uh, which has seen the rise of a fairly aggressive form of conservative religion, which does not believe in enlightened values, which would prefer to teach intelligent design or creationism in the schools as an alternative to Darwinian evolutionary theory, and which challenges the whole principles upon which separation of church and state have been based. If one sees a development like that, not in some bywater country, not in some country that's kind of missed 
the rise of modernity, but in the country that is the very essence and the very expression of all that is held to be dynamic and modern in the world, certainly this is cause for believing that perhaps we're entering uh, some new era with respect to issues of church uh, and state and the role they play with respect to one another. So that's one major reason. And of course, the second major reason is what's happening in your part of the world, a rediscovery of the power of religion in Europe, uh, a rediscovery that has been brought about by a number of factors, but I think primarily uh, it is caused by increased immigration of religious believers to a Europe that uh, was much more secular before this wave of immigration began than it is as this wave of immigration increases. But not only just the presence of religious immigrants moving to Europe, because that would seem to blame the immigrants. I think more interesting is the rediscovery among Europeans who have long roots in Europe, a rediscovery of the relationship between Europe and Christendom, a re, uh, establishment of a, a sense that Europe is primarily and primarily ought to remain Christian that takes the form of a reaction against immigration and especially immigration from Islamic countries. Some of the most secular countries in the world have rediscovered their Christianity. Often it's not a religious Christianity. It's what we in the United States would call an identity politics Christianity. Christianity as the expression of a particular almost ethnic uh, identity as opposed to a set of religious beliefs. But it's nonetheless the case, almost remarkably, that the fewer people that go to church in any particular European country, the greater will be the sense that that country is Christian in some way in order to meet what people in that country see as a threat from Islam. So between these developments of a greater emergence of what looks like some kind of theocratic tendencies in the United States and the rediscovery of religious conflict in Europe, may we not be at the end of this long settlement. And may we not be on the brink of some new emergence of a pattern of interaction between uh, religion and politics in which the kind of enlightenment slash separationist uh, slash non-establishment uh, view uh, of religion that has, I think, worked very, very well for a very long period of time is becoming increasingly obsolete. Well, that's the question that I want to share some thoughts with you about. Um, I uh, do think that we may be become, uh, we may be becoming, we may be coming to the end of an era, but I'm not one who worries significantly about it. In other words, yes, we are going, it seems to me, through an, an, an inevitable transition, but I do not see emerging out of this transition a return to some kind of pre-enlightenment, more theocratic uh, 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 relationship. We are not going backwards, in other words, that if we emerge out into some new settlement, it's not going to be the one that we experienced in the pre-modern period in Europe, but something entirely different. And I want to use my own country primarily as the argument for that, because uh, there is this concern that the United States is turning in a more theocratic direction. One of the major bestsellers in the United States now is a book called American Theocracy, written by an influential political consultant and analyst named Kevin Phillips. And there are also a very, very large number of books that predict some dangerous consequences for the United States from uh, uh, the reemergence of religious faith. Some of them written by atheists. Richard Dawkins, the prominent evolutionary psychologist, has contributed uh, to this literature. Daniel Dennett, another uh, a philosopher highly influenced by Darwinian theory has as well. But we now have a string of books in the United States warning us against a, pos a possible return to theocracy. If theocracy means government by religion, I think that those warnings are wildly overblown. And I wanna offer three reasons why, in my opinion, whatever is emerging in my country, and I hopefully both your countries are different, but whatever is emerging in my country, to characterize it as theocratic, would be wrong. It's emerging, something interesting is happening, but it is not theocratic. Not theocratic in any sense that refers back to the pre-modern history of Europe. For one thing, 
the separation of church and state, an issue that Hans Joas talked about uh, in, uh, uh, in, in his presentation just before mine, is very much alive and well in the United States. You may hear otherwise sometimes, and you certainly would be correct to get the impression that something is wrong uh, with the separation of church and state in the United States when you hear comments such as the one the president makes or when you read about uh, prominent American generals who talk about Islam as an inferior re religion to American Christianity as one of our leading military strategists have done. I mean, I can understand why people in Europe might conclude that the president of the United States is Jerry Falwell and the vice president is Pat Robertson. These more theocratically inclined people are certainly given a significant amount of attention. And it's also the case that President Bush is a deeply religious man, or so he says, I actually have no way uh, of knowing, but so, but so he says, uh, who does use religious language. There are also disturbingly theocratic developments happening in the United States. I could mention any number, but I'll just illustrate with one. The Air Force Academy is in the moment at the center of a huge uh, controversy in which the explicit endorsement by the military leadership of the uh, Air Force Academy of evangelical proselytizing methods in the recruitments of Air Force officers has become very, very prominent. The Air Force Academy, in case you don't know, is located in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And Colorado Springs, Colorado is also the home of almost all of the evangelical Christian, what we call parachurch organizations, such as the Reverend James Dobson's group, Focus on the Family, one of the most uh, 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 vehemently right-wing of the Christian groups that influenced the president. So in this hotbed of evangelical Protestantism, the Air Force Academy is uh, almost officially endorsing uh, proselytizing, uh, proselytizing for evangelical, among, arm, uh, among military officers. I mean, this is absolutely unforgivable in, in our society because this is not only violating separation of church and state, this is taking the symbol of national unity, the military, the, the one institution that embodies the defense of our entire security and using it for purely sectarian purposes. Uh, so you do hear about these kinds of things and there are causes for worry. But even, without, uh, even with those exceptions, I think in many ways, uh, uh, we are actually witnessing a flourishing of separationism in the United States rather than the opposite. And Hans already told us one of the reasons why. Hans mentioned the extremely important theologian and uh, religious uh, a figure in American history, Roger Williams, who was a Baptist. The Baptists are the single largest Protestant denomination in the United States, about one-fourth of all Americans are Baptists uh, of one kind or another. Baptists are usually thought of as among the more conservative, among the more evangelical of born-again Christians. But in fact, as Roger Williams' role in the history of the church indicates, Baptists have historically long believed, in fact, have been our firmest believers in church-state separationism. Many people believe that the separation of church and state was written into the American Constitution by Thomas Jefferson, and James Madison, who were Enlightenment figures, who personals, whose personal relig religiosity was a form of deism, a kind of soft, liquid religion. Uh, God sets the world in motion, but then he goes and retires to the sidelines. That, that kind of way of thinking about God. And, and it certainly is true that you can read in the writings of Jefferson and Madison skeptical ideas about uh, 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 established religions. Uh, historians point out that the first six presidents of the United States, not a single one of them was a conventional Christian. They included deists like Jefferson and Madison. A Unitarian denies the Trinity, John Adams. James Monroe, our sixth president, was probably as close to an atheist as one can find. So we, our, 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 the United States was started clearly in this era of the Enlightenment and separation of church and state is part of that. I often say that if the United States had been founded 30 years earlier or 30 years later, it would be a very different country because 30 years earlier was the first great awakening of Jonathan Edwards. 30 years later was the second greatest wake, uh, awakening of uh, uh, John Wesley and the Methodist Church. We happened to found our country right smack in the middle uh, between those two awakenings, fortunately, in my view. Uh, uh, nonetheless, while there's certainly a lot of truth that the United States was founded as a reflection of the Enlightenment. 
Jefferson would never have been able to have assembled a majority for his particular view of, the, uh, uh, of God. Even back then, he required the support of deeply devout religious believers. And fortunately, one of Jefferson's closest friends and strong political allies was the greatest Baptist thinker of his time, a direct and direct descent from Roger Williams, a man named John Leland, uh, who in Roger Williams' fashion argued that separation of church and state was good for religion. That separation of church and state protects the faithful against the interventions of government, just as Jefferson believed that separation checked, uh, uh, prevented religion uh, from influencing government too much. Separation of church and state came to the United States because both skeptics supported it and both deeply devout Protestants supported it. In fact, from a Protestant perspective, separation of church and state was another word for Protestantism, which meant church-state establishment was another word for Catholicism. Uh, and it was because the United States had so few Catholics everywhere in this country except in the state of Maryland uh, for Catholic years, naming a state after Mary was in itself an abomination. Uh, but with the exception of Maryland, this was a thoroughly Protestant country, and separationism in that sense came fairly easily. Now, it is true that there's been some falling back on that idea, including among the Baptists. Uh, uh, almost nobody knows this, but in 1973, when the United States Supreme Court issued its famous decision, Roe versus Wade, granting a woman the right to an abortion, the Southern Baptist Convention, the most conservative Protestant denomination in America, supported the Supreme Court's decision in Roe v. Wade. In part, Catholics were against it, so the Baptists would inevitably be for it. Well, that's our European contribution to uh, uh, plural. But in addition, Baptists believe, even as late as 1973, that if the state could tell a woman what it could do with her body, it could tell a man or a woman what to do with their minds. And the, this kind of libertarian idea of voluntarism, that you come to your own decisions in order to reach what's best for you and as between you and your God, is so central to Baptist history that you can understand why the Southern Baptist Convention supported a libertarian decision, a decision that was critical of government in 1973. Ten years later, they were totally opposed. They changed their minds. They issued an apology. Uh, and became leaders of the anti-abortion movement. But we are increasingly hearing echoes of the earlier tendency among conservative believers, the tendency that if you're a Protestant Christian, if you're a born-again Christian, it is wrong uh, to uh, uh, go away from the principle of separation of church and state. Catholics, by the way, since Vatican II, uh, also adopted the principle of separation of church and state, led by a very prominent American Catholic priest named John Courtney Murray. And so Catholics also have finally, uh, after many years, come around to endorsing the same principles. I won't go into this at any greater length, but I'll tell you that, that uh, just the other day, I was asked by our local paper, the Boston Globe, they asked some people in Boston, what in your opinion was the most important thing that happened in 2006? And some people will say the Red Sox didn't win the World Series. Uh, but what I will say is that a couple of weeks ago, Rick Warren, who's a very prominent, by the way, a Baptist minister, probably America's most prominent evangelical Christian, invited Senator Barack Obama to his church on World AIDS Day uh, to speak about the struggle against AIDS. The fact that such a prominent Baptist figure would invite a Democratic senator and a Democratic senator who's known as a supporter of a woman's right to choose really is an enormously significant development because it signals that Rick Warren, who's more pop, his book, The Purpose Driven Life, has sold 25 million copies. He's the most prominent evangelical preacher in America. He knows that the Baptist over-involvement with partisanship and politics has been bad for his religion. And he's reaching out, and, and now in bipartisan fashion, to suggest very, very strongly that he is no longer views himself as a client of the Republican Party. And I think this is increasingly the trend among serious religious thinkers in the United States. So separation of church and state is alive and well, and it's alive and well because it serves religion. Um, uh, and so we are a very religious country, but we are also a country that, in my view, is never going to go back to a theocracy because the separationism built into our culture is too powerful. Secondly, and again, Hans touched upon this briefly in his talk, 
A theocracy means that we uh, would establish government by religion. But there's an immediate problem in the United States if you tried to do that, and that is which religion would you choose? Uh, the most significant fact about American religion, and it's a fact that's been true from the very founding of the United States, is that no one religion has ever been a majority religion in the United States. Never, not once, not at any period of time have a majority of Americans belonged to one religion. We do not include a religious question on the census. We used to, but the Supreme Court threw that out at the turn of the 20th century in a decision that argued, I think quite rightly, that it was wrong for government to ask people personal confessional questions, that that would have the aura of oppression around it if the official representative of the government was knocking on your door and saying, oh, by the way, what is your religious faith? And so we don't include a religion question in the census. I gather you don't either uh, in, in Holland. Canada does. Different, different countries have different uh, experiences. France, of course, does not. Uh, we do not. And hence, we don't really know exactly and precisely who belongs to which religions. Uh, we use data that com uh, is compiled from surveys and compiled from churches themselves. But nonetheless, everyone who studies American religion agrees that the single religious denomination in the United States is the Catholic Church, with roughly 25% of Americans are Catholic. The second largest is the Southern Baptist Convention, with about 22% of Americans. The Methodist Church, which both George W. Bush and Hillary Clinton belong to, is about 20%. Uh, and so on, down to Jews, who 2%, Muslims, nobody knows. It's actually, the estimates wear, vary widely. One quarter of Americans, in other words, belong to uh, the largest religious denomination, and that's been true for at least well over 100 years. Uh, estimates from the latter part of the 19th century suggest that the Catholic Baptist population was almost identical in the latter part of the 19th century than it is now. So if you were to establish a religion, which one would it be? Um, you, you can't really establish any. And I think that that has all kinds of consequences uh, for arguments about the relationship uh, between religion and politics. Because it means that even though we have so many different religions, every single religion in America has one thing in common. And that is, every single religion in America is a minority religion. You have large, major, large minority religions and small minority religions, but every religion knows what it means to be in a minority. And being in, in a minority conveys a certain kind of uh, um, uh, similarity. You, if you're in a minority, always have to face the question of being different than everyone else. Uh, and that, I think, has enormous impacts upon what happens to uh, religion in the United States. One example I frequently use is that as we know, in this terribly tragic situation in the Middle East, we have religious wars, uh, certainly uh, between Israel and its neighbors, wars that are fueled, fueled by religious hostility uh, and religious hatred. In the United States, what is so striking within our country is the extent to which Jews and Muslims share so much because they're both minority religions in a predominantly Christian country. And so whereas elsewhere in the world they may be at war, in the United States they have all kinds of things that they need to tell each other. For example, if you're a Muslim and you cannot find halal food, is kosher food acceptable? The answer, by the way, is yes, it, it is acceptable. Uh, they both have to deal with the fact that more conservative members of both the Jewish faith and the Muslim faith emerge out of situations in which women and men were treated differently in houses of worship. But in the United States, the laws and the social norms require a commitment to gender equality. How do you negotiate your own, the history of your own religious tradition with the norms of the new society? Well, Jews and Muslims will frequently get together and say, here's how we deal with this. And Muslims say, well, here's how we, that their, their minority status is what, in fact, gives them a great deal in common. How do you pray? in a workplace environment. How, if you're a Jew and a Muslim, do you, do you respond to what's happening at the Air Force Academy? The example I mentioned earlier, because the suit against the Air Force Academy was brought by a Jewish uh, a graduate of that academy whose son was studying to be a cadet. Jews and Muslims, antagonistic outside the United States, but by their minority status, 
brought in common inside the United States. So the fact that all religions in America are minority religions seems to me to strike against any dangers of a return to a theocratic situation in which one religion becomes the major religion. But this example of Jews and Muslims suggests a third, uh, and, and, and in some ways even more important, reason why we will not be establishing a theocracy anytime soon. Uh, and that is because, in my view, you can study religion by looking at its sacred texts, by looking at its laws, by looking at what religious leaders say about it, or you can study religion by looking at the actual practices of ordinary people <coughs> in the course <coughs> of their actual lives. There has been a tremendous resurgence in the social sciences, uh, in uh, sociology and anthropology, and to some degree in political science, of what scholars call lived religion, the study of religion as it is actually practiced by real people, which means that you don't focus on the sacred texts. You don't focus on the clergy. You don't focus on the doctrines. You focus on what happens to people when they go to church, as opposed to, say, what the clergy will say when in church. And the picture that has emerged from this burgeoning literature on religion and practice, or, or lived religion, is a picture that would give great discomfort to anyone who thinks that we can reestablish a theocracy in the United States. Because religion and practice looks entirely different from religion in theory. In theory, a religion may say that our religious truth is true, which means that all other religious truths must be false, a one and true faith. That's not the way most Americans think about their religion. They may, they may love their particular religion, but if you were to ask them, hey, you know, you believe this, a, a Jewish person or a Catholic person, depending upon who you are, might believe something else. Does that mean that that person is going to go to hell and never be saved? And then there's always, always a kind of pause and awkwardness Oh no, you know, some of my best friends are Jewish, or uh, something like that will be, will be the response. Religious leaders, of course, I mean, this is a difficult thing to negotiate if you're a religious leader. If you are a born again Christian, you really do believe that through a born again relationship with Jesus is the only way to salvation. That is at the core of what you do. Everything you do follows from that. If you didn't believe that, you wouldn't be who you are. But, what about the people in your pews? Are they just going to go out and share that sentiment when in their world, the corporations they work for are filled with people from different traditions? The country clubs that they belong to are filled with people. It's an entirely different world for them. And I think this is a major difference. So the uh, uh, religions in theory is about creeds. It's about theologies. I sometimes say that, uh, and maybe you'll find this helpful, that you always hear that America is the most religious country among the rich liberal democracies. It, that's true. But it is the least theological among all the major liberal rich countries. There isn't much theology in America. There isn't much teaching of theology. There isn't much interest in theology. Theologies and creeds and doctrines just simply are not part of what people experience when they experience religion. Since I'm speaking in an environment so strongly influenced by Calvinism, I should mention that Calvinism's single largest religious denomination in the United States is the Presbyterian Church, not the Christian Reformed Church, which originally came from Holland, but the Presbyterian Church, which came from Scotland. Uh, uh, and uh, if I were to talk to Americans who belong to Presbyterian churches and say, hey, you know, there used to be this guy named John Calvin, and, and he believed in this idea called predestination. In fact, he actually believed in something called double predestination. You know, that whether or not you're going to go to hell or to heaven is entirely out of your hands. Nothing you do will influence God in any way whatsoever. And I say this to people in the Calvinist churches. And they say, well, I don't believe that. <laughs> in fact, they say no one could ever believe that. Because the idea of predestination is so alien, so foreign to the way Americans think about things. Obviously, going out and doing good things in the world will increase your chances of salvation. Obviously, being a good neighbor, you know, and not beating up your spouse and being nice to your children, God will look favorably. And I, no, actually, Calvin didn't actually believe that, you know. God's authority was so capricious 
so arbitrary that even someone who was beating up their child could conceivably be someone that God had selected for salvation. Oh, no, no, absolutely impossible. And this is within, you know, the churches that themselves claim to have uh, some, uh, uh, which, which may explain why so many Lutherans in America believe that Martin Luther was a great civil rights leader uh, who died, unfortunately, by an assassin's bullet. Or it's perhaps why 10% of Americans believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Um, which, you know, makes a certain amount of sense. There was an ark. People say, oh, ark. Joan. I know that um, you all hear that Americans are Bible readers. Um, may be true, but biblical knowledge in the United States is about at the same level as political knowledge. A recent poll a recent poll of people between the ages of 18 and 21 asked them which party controlled Congress. 50, in a two-party system, 50% will get that right randomly. Um, about 40% got it right. So political knowledge is not exactly high. Uh, biblical knowledge is roughly at the same level as we witnessed during some of our presidential campaigns when you may recall that Howard Dean, who was a candidate for uh, um, uh, president, thought that the uh, book of Job was in the New the New Testament, and uh, 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 so on. Uh, that didn't really count against them how many people could have identified uh, uh, which, which book it was in. in. In practice, religion is entirely, religion is really about the heart in practice. Religion is about emotion. Religion is about feeling. Religion is about identification with God. Religion is spiritual. I, I'm, I hope, and I realize when I tell some of these stories that it, it, may, be, it may come across that I'm being contemptuous because people don't know their own traditions and they don't know their religious history. And I don't mean to be contemptuous at all. I mean to be analytic and descriptive, to describe uh, a religion of feeling. Something that explains, for example, why so many Americans, so many Americans are born in one religion but migrate to another one in the course of their lifetime. Why 25%, uh, 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 roughly speaking, of uh, 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 Hispanic Americans are now evangelical Protestants rather than the Catholicism with which they're raised. Why even people within Protestant traditions change from one to another. If, if religion is that liquid, to use Wim van Dant's term here, if religion is that liquid, it too works against the establishment of any kind of theocracy. It actually promotes a considerable amount of toleration. I describe American religious switching as a moral insurance policy. It works this way that if you are 30 and you, and you belong to religion A, but you have no idea what religion you belong to when you're 60, because at 30 you belong to a different one than you did at 15, any negative comments you may make about a religion might be one you're going to join someplace down the road, let alone what religion your child might bring a spouse home uh, or uh, what you yourself might marry. Uh, Americans love marrying, they're constantly getting divorced, and constantly get, so you just don't know the next person uh, who it's going to be. So uh, in this kind of environment of fluidity, I think it, it thins out. Uh, we have thin rather than thick religions. And I'm sure for many theologians this is very disturbing. And when I say that I give this talk like this, and churches, uh, very, very often the reaction I'll get from the theological community from the clergy is that I'm painting a very depressing thinning out of religion and there would be a preference for a thicker sense of religious identity. For a theologian, that may very well be true. I'm not a theologian. It's not my business. I see the thinning out as in, indeed taking away from a certain kind of seriousness about religion, but at the same time adding a great deal of practical benefits for the problem of managing societies in uh, highly pluralistic periods. So I've given you three reasons then, the, the vibrancy of separation of church and state, uh, the religious pluralism in the United States, and the dynamics of religious practice uh, as characteristics of America, where I believe that those characteristics in the United States, even though we're witnessing something of a burgeoning uh, of religion, I, I would not conclude that there is a uh, a, a new theocracy emerging. Many people say that since the United States has already had three great awakenings, that this period with the rise of the religious right represents a fourth great awakening. I don't. 
The religious right has definitely arisen. It's definitely a factor. In my view, however, it's not because of some new religious outbreak among people. I actually view it as a political development, and I view its leading figures, such as Pat Robertson and Jerry Falwell, as political figures primarily. Uh, a, a movement that grew out of an opportunity that both the Republican Party and some conservative political activists saw to use religion to gain political power. I think it actually does not have that much to do with faith, and I would not therefore interpret it as the emergence of, uh, 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 of a new Great Awakening in the United States. Uh, I don't particularly like when people use religion to promote their political ideology, but it, again, has one benefit. It does encourage participation in a democracy. Everyone's entitled to express, to organize themselves. Conservative Christians are fully entitled. Their views on gay marriage, their views on uh, abortion, whatever it is, let them come out, let them be in the political system, let them argue it out. And what's happened while that happened, fascinating, fascinating what's happened, because over the 30 years as they've done that, more and more people, including more and more Christians and conservative Christians, recognize that if you change your mind on abortion from 1973 to 1984, God can't possibly have changed his mind over that period. It really is a political movement. And as a political movement, it is subject to the same kind of criticism that all other political movements are. There's no special sacred status that a group gets by clothing its political language in the language of God. Of course, they do that. They say, attack us and you're anti-religion. But in fact, once it's politics, attacks, defenses, those are perfectly proper. I have to leave to you if there are any implications of what I said for Europe um, and uh, for its particular situation later on in discussion or questions. I'm happy to uh, add whatever I know, but that's the expertise of others. And again, I, I thank you. This has been a wonderful experience for me to come here to Holland and to be a participant in this important event. Thank you all very much. <laughs>